Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Israel's militaries bombed parts of the Gaza Strip after Palestinian militants fired rockets at southern Israel overnight. The Israeli airstrikes targeted the Al Shati refugee camp northwest of Gaza City, which is among one of the most densely populated areas of the besieged Palestinian territory. Israel says one of the rockets fired from Gaza landed in an open field, while five others were shot down by Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system. The latest violence follows an Israeli raid on the west. Bank city of Nablus Wednesday that killed 11 Palestinians. Health officials report more than 500 suffered tear gas insulation and other injuries. 82 people treated for gunshot wounds after the assault. Among the wounded is Palestinian TV journalist Mohammed Al Khatib, who was shot in the hand. On Wednesday, the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process Tour of Venisland said he was, quote, deeply disturbed by the continuing cycle of violence and appalled by the loss of civilian lives, end quote. His comments came after the head of Amnesty International, Agnès Calamar, called on the U.N. Human Rights Council to turn its attention to the occupied Palestinian territories. At a moment where we ask the entire international community to support Ukraine against the Russians' aggression, it's absolutely right. This Russian aggression is unthinkable. We cannot allow it. But we also cannot allow what is happening in the occupied territories of Palestine. The Human Rights Council must raise these two realities and insist on these two realities. In Moscow, Russian President Vladimir Putin led a massive pro-war rally Wednesday, coming just ahead of the first anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. An estimated 200,000 people joined the rally in Moscow's main stadium. That's roughly the equivalent of the number of Russian soldiers estimated to have been killed or wounded in Ukraine. This week, the head of the Russian mercenary Wagner Group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, accused the Russian Defense Ministry of Treason for allegedly attempting to destroy Wagner by withholding ammunition and supplies. The U.S. estimates more than 20,000 members of the Wagner Group have been injured in Ukraine, with about 9,000 killed in action. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden wrapped up his three-day trip to Ukraine and Poland Wednesday with a meeting of the Bucharest Nine, leaders of nations on NATO's eastern flank. Biden pledged the U.S. would invoke Article 5 of NATO's charter, the Collective Self-Defense Clause, if any member is attacked. Article 5 is a sacred commitment the United States has made. We will defend literally every inch of NATO, every inch of NATO. A federal judge in New York ruled 9-11 families cannot claim $3.5 billion from the Central Bank of Afghanistan as compensation. Judge George Daniels said, quote, neither the Taliban nor the plaintiffs are entitled to raid the coffers of the state of Afghanistan to pay the Taliban's debts. Thelmany was part of $7 billion of Afghan funds that were deposited in the New York Federal Reserve and frozen by President Biden after the Taliban takeover in 2021. He subsequently allocated half of that money to aid efforts in Afghanistan, as Afghans and rights groups fought to return all the funds to the Afghan people amidst an ongoing humanitarian disaster. The combined death toll from the February 6 earthquake and its aftershocks in Turkey and Syria has topped 49,000, according to CNN, and continues to rise. The U.N. is warning there's an urgent need for shelter and aid in both countries. At least one and a half million people in Turkey became homeless from the quakes. Meanwhile, the government of Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has issued fines to three broadcasters who aired coverage critical of the official earthquake response. In Nigeria, 18 presidential candidates have signed a second peace pact ahead of Saturday's pivotal elections in Africa's most populous nation. Nigerians will cast ballots for the next president, as well as lawmakers, as Mohamedou Buhari steps down after serving the two presidential terms allowed by the Constitution. It's the first time a candidate who's not from one of the two main parties could win since the end of military rule nearly a quarter of a century ago. The three front runners are Bola Tumubu of the ruling All Progressives Congress, a Abubakar of the main opposition party, People's Democratic Party, and Peter Obi of the Labour Party. Voters are hoping the next leader will be able to address the ongoing security threats from insurgents to kidnappings, as well as double-digit inflation and unprecedented oil theft. 
Violence has plagued Nigeria in the run-up to the election. On Wednesday, gunmen killed a senatorial candidate from the Labour Party in southeastern Inugu state, just days after suspected rebels killed eight police officers. Some people say they'll not vote for fear of reprisals, as Nigeria's Electoral Commission announced Monday. 240 polling stations will remain closed because of security concerns. This is a farmer in Zamfara state who was forced to flee his home last year after his community came under attack. Because my life is being threatened by bandits, they are targeting my life. I barely managed to escape from the east, and they are still looking for me. So how can I go out and cast my vote? Here in the United States, the special counsel leading the Justice Department's criminal probes into Donald Trump has subpoenaed Ivanka Trump, his daughter, and Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, to testify to a federal grand jury about efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 election. That's according to The New York Times, which reports the subpoenas by special counsel Jack Smith follow similar efforts to compel the testimony of Vice President Mike Pence, who's reportedly resisting his subpoena. Trump's former national security adviser, Robert O'Brien, and former chief of staff Mark Meadows were also recently subpoenaed by Smith. Minnesota lawmakers have approved a bill ending a requirement that applicants seeking a driver's license show proof of legal residence in the United States. Democratic Governor Tim Walz has promised to sign the Driver's Licenses for All bill, which will benefit more than 80,000 undocumented immigrants, most of whom are over the legal draving age of 16. The legislation was co-sponsored by state senator Zeneb Mohammed, who moved to Minneapolis from with her family at age nine from Somalia. What we're doing is we're doing a rule change to allow undocumented people to not have to provide social security numbers because they don't have that. This debate is about the safety of our roads, and we can debate that tonight if you'd like, because there are 40,000 accidents on the highways. And the people of Minnesota, they want to make sure that the people who are driving on our roads have the driving education that they need. Passage of the Driver's Licenses for All bill caps two decades of campaigning by immigrant rights groups. Also Wednesday, Minnesota senators approved a bill to restore voting rights to people convicted of felonies as soon as they're released from prison, rather than once they've completed their parole. Current restrictions on voting have disproportionately affected black and Native American Minnesotans. In Florida, three people were shot dead Wednesday in Orange County, including a nine-year-old girl and a journalist covering the violence. The violence began when a gunman opened fire on a 20-year-old woman, killing her. Hours later, the suspect returned to the scene and fired on journalists covering the initial shooting, killing 24-year-old Spectrum News reporter Dylan Lyons and critically wounding photojournalist Jesse Walden. The nine-year-old was shot dead inside a home with her mother. Uh, where her mother was also found in critical condition. Police arrested a suspect with a lengthy criminal history that includes weapons charges. Weekend news anchor Luana Munoz of Orlando NBC affiliate WESH covered the scene. This is every reporter's absolutely worst nightmare. We, we go home at night afraid that something like this will occur. And that, that is what happened here. Um, so again, we are at Orlando Regional Medical Center, where we have learned that one of our own, a fellow reporter, uh, has died while, while out covering a shooting. The Orlando shootings came as four family members were found shot to death in Daphne, Alabama. They were the 83rd and 84th mass shootings recorded in the United States since January 1st, well over averaging one a day. The attorney general of Pennsylvania is investigating possible criminal charges over the derailment of a Norfolk Southern train in East Palestine, just across the border in Ohio. Governor Josh Shapiro said environmental officials are continuing to monitor for any contamination in his state of Pennsylvania. Shapiro spoke Tuesday at a press conference with Ohio Governor Mike DeWine and EPA head Michael Regan. We will hold accountable Norfolk Southern, the company that made this vigilance necessary. The combination of Norfolk Southern's corporate greed, incompetence, and lack of care for our residents is absolutely unacceptable to me.
Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg is visiting East Palestine today after coming under enormous pressure for his initial response to the disaster. Critics say he should have visited the site of the crash immediately and rejected his claims that he was powerless to improve rail regulations. On Wednesday, former President Trump visited East Palestine and blasted Biden's response to the crash, as well as his absence, saying he was busy, quote, touring Ukraine. In 2018, the Trump administration rescinded an Obama-era rule that would have required more sophisticated brakes on trains carrying hazardous materials. Trump's EPA also rolled back many other environmental regulations. And here in New York, environmental groups and community members are sounding the alarm after Holtec International, the owner of the decommissioned Indian Point nuclear plant, said it plans to dump some one million gallons of radioactive water into the Hudson River as soon as August. The water contains tritium, a byproduct of nuclear fission that cannot be filtered out of water and which could lead to a host of negative environmental and health effects. The advocacy group Riverkeeper said, quote, it's time to draw the line against using the Hudson as a dumping ground. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Nermeen Sheikh. Hi, Nermeen. Hi, Amy, and welcome to our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world.